We're going through Leviticus 19, the one chapter of the law, as a challenge to see how, as Christians in the New Covenant, we should read the Old Testament law. And I chose 19 because there's a great diversity of texts which challenge us in many different ways. Again, there's beloved texts. You know, you shall love your neighbor as yourself is found first here. There's strange but beautiful texts once you unpack them, such as peace offerings. There's puzzling texts, which we dealt, dealt with a few weeks ago, about you can't mix cloth together, different types of cloth together. Why is that? And then there's texts that shock and offend, and to use the modern word, trigger modern readers and modern ears. Today, it's one of those texts that shock and offend. It's texts, as we just read, that deal with rules governing physical relations between one's female slaves. So we're going to ponder that today. Now, for sake of focus, I don't want to focus on slavery today. I've preached on slavery before, the biblical understanding of slavery. We went through the book of Philemon. Today, I want to focus on the male-female aspects of this part of the law. But first, let me deal with a concern. A few years ago, I know I, there was a gentleman uh, that visited a few times this church, and nice gentleman, but he was very concerned whenever I preached texts like this. And he argued that we should not preach these kind of texts on Sunday morning. They're, they're not appropriate for children. Children should not hear these texts. And that's a fair concern. Because Christians, especially in worship, should function with decorum. How does Paul put it in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4? There must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting. Well, what do we do with this? You know, should we teach children this text? Should this be a public text that's written in Scripture? Well, my answer is yes, and how do I know that? It says so in Scripture. We read in 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, that famous, famous verse. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for the training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. And remember, when we hear that word Scripture in the New Testament, it almost always means the Old Testament. Not denying the New Testament, of course, is Scripture, but the New Testament is being written at this time. So when we hear texts like 2 Timothy 3.16 and it says Scripture, it's in particular focusing on the Old Testament. And so to reject or ignore the Old Testament is actually to reject the New Covenant. And the Bible, as we read in our, in our, our first sermon text, does command that the Word of God be taught to children. Remember from Deuteronomy chapter 31, 10 through 13, and again, we just read it. Every seven years, all of Israel is to assemble and before and appear before the Lord. And quote, all the men and the women and children and the alien to hear God's law read to them. Why? We're told, verse 12, so that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to observe all the words of this law. And if you keep on reading in verse 13 in particular, that their children who have not known will hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. As long as you live on the land which you're about to cross, the Jordan to possess it. So this text, like all of scripture, is to be read, I would argue, in the presence of children. Yes, you're supposed to do it with decorum. Yes, you can explain it in an appropriate way, but you should give them all the law. I know some parents, when they teach their kids or young kids the Ten Commandments, you know, they leave out the Seventh Commandment about adultery. Like, no, 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 you don't mention that to kids. That's too graphic. Well, yeah, you don't go into detail, but you still teach them what adultery is. You put it in kids' language. You know, mommy can only kiss daddy, and daddy can only kiss mommy. They get the concept. And so all of the law is to be taught to all ages. So let's take a look at Leviticus 19, 20, and 21, this admittedly very challenging text. Now remember, we're dealing with the Old Covenant civil law. This is a law for ancient Israel from around, what, 1450 BC. The meaning is pretty clear. 
if the owner of a female slave has relations with her and she is promised or betrothed to another man, a crime has been committed. Now, for the ancient Jews, being betrothed is a much more serious thing than a mere modern engagement. It's a formal, it's a legal matter. It's a contractual thing. They're basically married, just not yet physically. And it requires legal action to have a divorce. And if you remember when in Christmas and during Advent, we talked about that. Joseph finds out Mary, who he's engaged to, is pregnant and not by him. So therefore, he's going to divorce her. He's going to put her away. Until, of course, the angel appears and tells him a supernatural thing has happened. But because a sin has been committed, there is a crime, and there must be punishment. Before we get to this, let's think about the related Old Testament laws that deal with related crimes. For the heinous crime of adultery, both man and woman are to be executed, directly violating God's law. If a man sexually assaults, an engaged or married woman, that man is to be executed. The rapist dies, but the woman is innocent. If a man seduces and has relations with an unengaged virgin, he must pay a dowry to that father, and he must marry the girl. The, the father has the right to refuse the marriage, but the dowry still must be paid because there's been a crime. If a man rapes an unengaged virgin, the man must pay a dowry to his, that woman's father. He must marry the woman, and he can never divorce her. What's your reaction to this? For most of our modern secular years, we have a huge knee-jerk reaction to this. We have a hostile reaction to this. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. There's nothing wrong with wrestling with the word of God. We're called to do that. But also remember the purpose of Scripture is to cut deep. It's to expose bad thinking and bad actions. And when we approach these texts, especially in the Old Testament, we have to remember there's a difference between the ancient and modern worlds. And it really shows some fundamental differences. We moderns, let us be blunt, we think the purpose of life is happiness, our own personal happiness, because we live in such wealth and such protection. And Praise God for that. You know, we live in the advancements of a modern Western Christian civilization that's been greatly influenced by the new covenant. And praise God for all his provision and his mercy. For the ancients, however, life was not about happiness. Life was about survival. And when you view life as survival, you have a very different set of agenda. Life was hard and if not, if not necessarily brutal. Death was common. Many children died in childbirth. Many women would die in giving childbirth. Childhood was a very dangerous thing, and let alone if you get something as simple as tetanus, you get some metal stuck and it rusts in your hand or whatever, you're probably going to die. And this was the norm for almost all of human history and only to, only, until only very recently. And it's still the norm in many places. And so when you think about life being about survival, and not about happiness. The old covenant law, the civil law, start making much more sense. And if you can fight that initial knee-jerk reaction, or maybe have a knee-jerk reaction, you're like, okay, calm down, wait a minute, let me think about this. This is the word of God. I would argue there's a great beauty in God's civil ceremonial law in the Old Testament, and including in this text, and including those texts I referenced. Because remember how God views his law. Remember the very first psalm, the very first two verses of that psalm. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit at the seat of scoffers, but his delight is the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Or how about from the New Covenant, 1 Timothy 1.8? But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So these ideas might sound barbaric to us. You know, especially that reference I made, a woman has to marry her assaulter. But actually by ancient standards, 
if you think about it, it's quite merciful. Look what happens. She and her child are guaranteed to be taken care of. Her child will be legitimate and have a future in the community. And the man cannot terminate those rights. And let me ask, by the ancient standards, what else is the alternative? Well, can we call social services, maybe inform the local police, go to the local hospital? None of those exist. We're talking Bronze Age culture. How else could you provide for a woman but by these laws? And so when you stop and, and you avoid that knee-jerk reaction, or maybe have it a little bit, then, but calm down and think about it, there's actually such beauty to this text. Let me read Leviticus 19.20 again. Let's get back to that text. Now, if a man lies cardinally with a woman who is a slave acquired from another man, but who was in no way been redeemed nor given her freedom, there shall be punishment. They shall not, however, be put to death because she was not free. So you have a man who owns a female slave, according to the Old Testament civil law. He has relations with his female slave. They will not be put to death. Why? Because the woman is a slave. Now, it's interesting, the punishment is not described. Maybe giving freedom for the judge, depending on the circumstances. And it seems, at the very least, of course, the man's going to get punished. Because we read in verse 21, he is the one to bring a guilt offering before the Lord. And a sin or guilt offering covers intentional or unintentional sins which is impossible to make restitution. It's a bloody, it's a vicarious offering. The animal is killed in the person's place of the sinner because God demands that there be blood. More about that next week. However, if you read carefully the law, for that truly to work, there also needs to be repentance, as Pastor Dan talked about in the children's message, a changing of mind that's required, or God will not forgive because it's just a simple ritual and it's not a change of heart. But what do we do with texts like Leviticus 19.20? It's tempted to say, you know what, you know, you know what, Pastor, you've been teaching us that the Old Testament civil law is no longer ap applicable to the new covenant, and that's true. Let's just, let's just ignore it. Let's just move beyond it. And true, again, praise the Lord, we live in a world of the new covenant. You know, praise the Lord, we live in a society that does not have slavery. And of course, slavery was first outlawed by Christian nations. We live in an advanced society that comes from the Reformation, that working out of the New Testament covenant. And praise God, we don't have to do animal sacrifices on Saturday morning or Saturday because of Christ. However, all scripture is profitable. Even the Old Testament civil law and the law shows us the mind of God and we should meditate on it. And when we look at the principles found in Leviticus 19.20, we hear things clearly taught throughout the New Covenant. In Leviticus 19.20, we hear the notion of God's created order, especially with regards to gender. Men are to lead, they're to provide, and they're to protect their families. They are to engage in appropriate sexual morality. They are to lead their house in worship. It is the man who brings the sin offering. And if there's shame that comes upon the household, it is the job of the man to man up and take that public humbling, if so required by God's law. So we have this created order. We hear the importance of marriage. Slavery didn't even override engagements or marriage. Why? Because that goes back beyond the civil and ceremonial law to the very creation of things. As the Lord Jesus quoting or referring to Genesis 2 would say in Matthew 19, so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. The importance of marriage. The importance of sexual morality we find here. And biblical sexual morality is very simple. Total abstinence outside of marriage, total monogamy within. As we read in the New Covenant, Hebrews 13, verse 4, marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for fornicators and adulterers will be judged. Also, you hear justice in this verse. 
There's a beautiful balance. There's a quality before the law. If you're guilty, you're guilty. It doesn't matter your social standing, doesn't matter your gender. Guilty is guilty, and guilty brings punishment. But yet there's also an understanding of the circumstances. There's charity to the weak. And by ancient world, we're talking, of course, women and slaves. And God has and always love, will love these things. And you hear them in Leviticus 19. And you hear it throughout Gen from the very beginning in Genesis to the very end of the book in Revelation. The things of the created order, the importance of marriage, the importance of sexual morality, the importance of justice are pleasing to God. And you hear that in God's civil ceremonial law. And let's be blunt, the world now hates these things. And they're under a song. But we Christians should love them. The law also exposes, by the way, our worldly thinking. You know, one of the greatest lies of the religion of secularism is that we're radically autonomous individual beings. That our feelings and our experiences are the most important. And they define who we are. And they're authoritative. It's about me, myself, and I, and how I feel and how I think. No one has the right to tell an individual self what to think or feel. The self defines the self. Not God, not his word, not his church, and not his created order. That's insane. That's irrational. That's ungodly. That's selfish. That's, let me use the biblical word, moronic. God's word tells us who we are and what we are. And we're defined not by our selfishness, but we're defined by how we love others. That's the biblical way. First, how we love God. Next, how we love our neighbor, which includes the church and everyone and even our enemies. God's word defines us. and God's word is summed up in love. But I am loving how God defines it. But supremely, we hear in the law, Christ. Do you hear Christ in the gospel in this verse? Any verse in scripture actually is a communion verse. As we read in our call to worship, the law is a tutor to lead us to Christ. Before Christ's grace, in our fallen state, we are by nature, as we read in Ephesians and Colossians, we are slaves to sin. We're slaves to our lust. We belong to Satan. And we're spiritually dead before Christ comes into our hearts. But with Christ, all those things are past tense because in Christ, we are freed. The law no longer judges us. We're free from keeping the civil law. We are no longer enslaved to sin because we now live by the Spirit. We are not slaves, but instead we're adopted and heirs with Christ, with full benefits of that royal family. And we are now Christ's bride. We are royal. And not only his bride, we're also spiritually like a virgin. We are pure. Solely by the blood of Christ. Because we've been redeemed in Christ. Remember that word redeemed? It was back in our sermon text. Let me read it again. Now, if a man lies carnally with a woman who is a slave required from another man, but, ha but who was in no way been redeemed nor given her freedom. That word redeemed in Old and New Testament means to be ransomed, to be bought back, to have someone cause your freedom, to someone to release you from enslavement. To redeem is to be bought away from slavery and bought into, brought into freedom to be rescued from distress. And that's why Christ is our Redeemer. We have been freed. We have been declared holy. We've been declared righteous and pure. We are his. We are his bride. Therefore, act like it. And as we go to this royal table, as we come to communion, let the law rip into you. Let it expose your foolish thinking. Let us hear the mind of God and let us praise God. We are freed from the civil law. But let us also hear Christ and him crucified. 
and let us hear his gospel. I did this last a few weeks ago, but I want to do it again. I put in your bulletin a section from Galatians chapter 3 on. I want to read to you before we come to the table. And I want you to think about this Old Testament law that we so have a knee-jerk reaction against. But yet it is the word of God. It's the law of God. But hear what Christ does. And by the way, if you get a chance, please read all of Galatians. This is going to be a cut-and-paste version, but go read the whole book because it's beautiful. But let me, let me conclude with this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, Deuteronomy 21, quoting the law. In order that, that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit, how? Through the law? No, through faith. Now, is the law contrary to the promises of God? Is Leviticus 19 contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. But the scripture, the Old Testament, has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. So we may be justified by, keeping the law, no, justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Oh, that's extraordinary. We're no longer under the civil ceremony law. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. No longer slaves, but as children. Because you are sons and daughters, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, literally, Daddy, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son and a daughter. And if a son, then an heir through God. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity of the flesh. But through love, serve one another, referring to the church. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And guess what chapter of the Bible that's from? Leviticus 19. But the fruit of the Spirit is joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Amen.